I'm going to do the reading today. So it is in 1 Corinthians 15 and it's from verses 50 to 58. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immorality. When the perishable have been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immorality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Let's ask the Lord what he wants to say to us through the scripture that um, Claire has just read to us. So let's pray just for a moment and then we'll think about what it might mean for us. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your scriptures that help us uh, through the good times and the bad. They remind us of your goodness. They point us back to Jesus and they help us to consider how we might live in the light of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. God, we ask you that you would come by your Holy Spirit and speak to each one of us as we consider your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I wonder whether you've started to consider what life might be like after the lockdown has finished. We're beginning to hear a bit more in the news about, well, what's going to happen? What's it going to look like? How are we going to get out of it? What's the exit strategy? And like I said on Easter Day, it helps us think a bit about what it means to live in hope. We're currently living in one particular way, but we're hopeful about what life will look like when things change. We have some experience of life right now, but we're longing for a greater, fuller experience of life. Maybe uh, you're like Toby. Toby said uh, sometime this week, he said, I just can't wait until we can go to a restaurant again, uh, which made me laugh. We don't go to restaurants that often, but obviously that's something that he really is looking forward to. I wonder what you are looking forward to uh, when the lockdown comes to an end. Of course, it seems that the lockdown is going to end uh, slowly or progressively, so we're not really sure what things are going to look like when. But I think all of us are longing to get sort of normal routines uh, once again being able to see some people, being able to hug people, being able to enjoy one another's company that's not just on a screen. But living in hope also allows us time to reflect on how things might be different in the future as well. I don't know if you saw in the news, but one recent poll said that only 9% of people, so virtually nobody, well, very few people, want life to return to normal after the lockdown finishes. Uh, there's a stronger sense of connection with friends and family. People are enjoying cleaner air. They're appreciating nature. They're valuing food more, this survey said. And many people have become closer to their own neighbours. And people want it to continue when the lockdown ends. So living in hope means we're imagining as a country right now what it, life might look like when lockdown finishes and wanting to live a little bit differently because of it. And I want to think with you today about the resurrection of Jesus and how that helps us as Christians live in a different way. In the reading that Claire did for us, it comes to the end of a long chapter, um, comes to the end of a long argument from Paul, where he's trying to make the point about how different the resurrection life, our future hope is to the life that we're living now. The difference between the perishable and the imperishable. The difference between the mortal and the immortal. And in earlier verses, he uses the analogy of seeds. Now, I never claim to be a very good gardener, but a couple of weeks ago when we knew the lockdown was happening and the food shortages hit and we weren't quite sure how long that was going to take, we thought, all right, let's try and grow some of our own food. So we bought some tomato seeds and we bought a couple of other 
pardon me, seeds as well. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we sowed them. And if you saw my Instagram story yesterday, I got a little bit overexcited because there's some tiny, tiny little green leaves growing up out of the ground. These seeds that had been planted had started to grow. It's really interesting that Paul uses that analogy, that it would be very hard for the seed the example in his argument of the perishable life or the mortal life to imagine what it would be like to be a plant. So for a tomato seed, which is tiny little thing, to imagine what it would be like to be a tomato plant, which is really quite big and provides lots of tomatoes. That, in Paul's analogy, is the imperishable and the immortal, as opposed to the tiny little perishable and mortal seed. It's hard to imagine, but the Bible does give us some hints about what life might be like. And it tells us that the Holy Spirit is the down payment, the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And so we get a taste of resurrection life in this life, even though we won't experience the fullness of it until the future. And so... The more that we allow the Holy Spirit access into our lives and the more we walk in step with him, the more we will experience some of the resurrection life in the here and the now. Now, that's not to say that everything's going to be easy. But Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, we live in the light of his resurrection and the victory then has been won. Death has been swallowed up in victory. I love that analogy. Death has lost its sting. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulfilment of these Old Testament prophecies that Paul is quoting from in 1 Corinthians 15. It's amazing and it gives us hope. Our future is to live in the fullness of the victory. And the challenge for us in the present is to begin to step into it now. I wonder if you've ever moved house Uh, You live in the light of something that has already happened. You've sold your house uh, and you live in the light of something that's about to happen. You're about to move house. And because you're living in the light of something that has already happened and something that is going to happen, you live slightly differently. You think slightly differently. You do slightly different things. You'll know what it's like if you've moved house uh, to try to imagine what things will be like when you finally move. You've tried to work out what the neighbourhood is like. You think about how you might decorate the rooms and where you put might put different bits of furniture. You imagine yourself living in the space and working out what it might be like, thinking about some of the neighbours that you might meet, the places that you might go, the things that you might do. And whilst you're getting ready for the move itself, you're packing boxes, you're sorting through different things. What do I really need to keep? What can I actually throw away because I haven't properly unpacked them or used them since the last time I moved house? We were guilty of that. So get rid. And this time between times means that we end up thinking about what life will be like and making decisions in light of where we are going, not just where we have been. And that's a little illustration of what it's like to begin to live more fully in the victory that Jesus has won for us. He's won for us an amazing victory by defeating death itself at a resurrection. And he's inviting us into the resurrection life when we die and are raised to life afresh with him at his second coming. That is our hope, that Jesus is alive, that he will come and sort everything out and that we will get to share in that fulfilment of all of the prophecies and promises of God. But as I said a little earlier, we might talk about being living in the victory, but that doesn't mean that the Christian life is easy. When you start following Jesus, think about it this way. Uh, sorry, when, before you follow Jesus, the only enemy that you've got is a God who loves you and wants the very best for you. The moment that you start to follow Jesus, suddenly you are living in opposition to what the baptism vows help us understand as the world, the flesh, and the devil. Three very strong influences on us that would seek to draw us away from following Jesus and dying to ourselves and living to him. 
What the world, the flesh and the devil want us to do is to think about ourselves first and put our own appetites beyond helping other people or living in the light of Jesus's victory. So how then do we live this resurrection life? How do we live now in the light of what has happened and what will happen? Well, in the final verse of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has two suggestions for us, and I'd like to look at them both with you right now. The first one is this. Let nothing move you. Stand firm. This is about us being confident in the faith that we have in Jesus and standing firm in all his promises for us. On Thursday, it was St. George's Day. Uh, I don't know if you celebrate that and if it's a big deal for you, but um, certainly it's the patron saint of England. Uh, And he's famous for a whole number of things, very few of which are likely to have been part of his life when you do some reading about St. George. We actually know very little about him. Of course, there's an infamous story about him slaying the dragon, and we don't really know where that came from. It certainly came almost 10 centuries after he was alive, or that was the first writing down of that particular story. What we do know about this guy, George, was that he was a Christian working in the Praetorian Guard. Now, the Praetorian Guard was uh, the the crack team that worked with the Roman emperor as their personal bodyguard and as spies for the empire. But the emperor that George was serving under was a guy called Diocletian. And Diocletian saw himself, this was in around 290 AD, uh, Diocletian saw himself as the person who would restore Rome to its former glory. And he came to the conclusion that it was Christians who were causing Rome to crumble. And he started surrounding himself with people who publicly opposed Christianity. Now just think about that. George is serving in the elite guard for the emperor. And so George would have seen all of these people gathering around. He may have heard some of the conversations that were happening in the emperor's palace about how these awful Christians were ruining the glory of Rome. And there he was as a Roman soldier. It was a dangerous time to be a Christian. It was a pretty dangerous time to be in the Roman army as a Christian. It was a really dangerous time to be in the Praetorian Guard as a Christian. And in time, his Christian faith was exposed. And we don't quite know how, there's two different uh, stories about how he lost his life, but he ended up giving his life for his faith. He chose, even in the midst of incredibly difficult circumstances, to stand firm and let nothing move him. Following Jesus is not always easy. We don't know what George might have been thinking when he was serving in the Praetorian Guard and seeing all that was happening politically around him. He must have known that his faith was putting his life at risk. And yet he did stand firm, knowing that Christ gave everything for him. And so he was willing to give everything for Christ. Now, I hope that none of us have to ever make that kind of a choice. But around the world today, there are Christians being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. And they are standing firm, letting nothing move them. And I want those stories not to just fill us with compassion, but to fill us with confidence and faith. That our God is one worth worshipping, worth giving ourselves to, worth standing firm in our faith. That nothing might move us, even though life may be hard. And we need each other in this time. That's why I'm so encouraged hearing the stories of Connect Groups meeting together. One Connect Group leader was telling me that they've never had more people come along to their Connect Group. It's a fantastic way of people joining, connecting. And if you are working, you're probably sick of Zoom calls, but I want to encourage you to still keep connecting. When it comes to the end of an evening and we're thinking, I really can't bear another Zoom call, I wanna encourage you to press in and connect with other people. Because when we support one another, It means that we're more able to stand firm and not be moved. We can inspire one another to live a life of faith, confident in the victory of Jesus, even when we might be going through hardships. And that leads us then to the second point that Paul makes. Stand firm, let nothing move you, he says, 
And then the second thing, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that the labour, your labour in the Lord is not in vain. The work of the Lord is to see his kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. It's to see others come into that resurrection life. It's to pray and to serve and to witness, to share, to love others and to work with Jesus as he is making all things new. To be a prophetic voice in stewarding creation, to help other people looking after the poor and the vulnerable and sharing the good news of Jesus. So thank you to those of you who filled a bag of hope. Thank you to those of you who have thought about doing it but haven't got around to it yet. Please, I want to encourage you to fill a bag of hope. Buy those 10 items in the supermarket. Drop them off in one of the bins outside the church when you're able. I would argue that that is essential work as we seek to be a blessing to others. And if you need to, you can blame me if you get stopped by the police. I'm really happy to answer for you in that. So thank you to those of you who've done Bags of Hope. Please, let's keep going on it. And thank you to those of you who sign up to help with Alpha. And please, let's use tomorrow as a time to fast and pray because we want to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We don't just want to waste the time that we've got in lockdown. There's so much opportunity to watch all sorts of things on Netflix or other streaming services, to spend time hanging out with friends on Zoom or social media. But how about taking 90 minutes to ask and to think about the answers to some of life's biggest questions? Let's use this opportunity to invite people to think about Jesus, to think about life's biggest questions. Let's pray. Let's fast. Let's give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. It means asking, God, what would you have me do with this time that I've got? Now, many of you, if you're key workers like Claire or some of the other healthcare uh, professionals that we've had, or you're in another key working industry, then, well, God bless you. You keep working as hard as you are and we'll be praying for you to be sustained and encouraged in what it is that you're doing. But if you have got time, then ask the Lord, what can I do with this time? How can I be a blessing? And like Lizzie said earlier, thank you to those of you who are volunteering and trying to support other people and using your time to acknowledge and serve others. Now, along with us launching Alpha this week, um, Alpha UK uh, did some advertising in London uh, just during this season when they were starting to do Alpha online. And literally hundreds and hundreds of people have started to do Alpha. They're wanting to do the same in Manchester. In fact, they're going to do the same in Manchester and Simon's working hard behind the scenes to try and help set up different Alphas so that we can respond to possibly hundreds of people in Manchester wanting to learn more about Jesus. What does it mean to give yourself fully to the work of the Lord? Maybe this week it means emailing Simon and saying, hey, I'd love to be involved if there's any way that I could be. For those of us who have time, let's give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. For those of you who are key workers, you're already giving yourselves in love and service to others and I encourage you to keep going, keep doing it, keep pressing in and loving and serving the Lord. This is how we live the resurrection life. We stand firm in our faith and we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Standing firm in faith, giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Now we celebrate and worship a God who is alive and is at work. Last week, we offered the opportunity for people to pray for some healing. We asked the Holy Spirit to come and said, if you've got a particular pain, then please lay a hand on wherever that pain might be. Somebody texted us during the week and said that as they did that, they experienced a level of healing uh, that they weren't expecting when they prayed for that particular thing to go. We serve a God who is real. We serve a God who is at work. We serve a God who loves us and gave everything for us. And so let's be confident in what it is that God has given to us. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit more fully into our lives to give him greater access into our hearts and that we would seek to follow him more fully with all that he has for us 
by standing firm in the faith and giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. I'm going to pray and then Lizzie's going to come and help us think about how we might respond to what it is that God might be saying to you today. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you that you love us so much. Thank you for all that Jesus did for us. Thank you that he stood firm and gave himself fully to the work of the Lord. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and help us begin to live out more fully that resurrection life in our lives. Lord, that we might stand firm, letting nothing move us, and that we might give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's just keep our eyes shut, shall we? And um, let's just give a minute and ask the Lord, what is it you're saying to me through what Gareth shared? So come, Holy Spirit, welcome yes. me. And uh, when I was praying, I just really felt um, the Lord uh, want to encourage a number of you and just say, well done. He's really proud of you. Mm. Uh, he sees all your hard work um, and it's not in vain. And um, someone from our church had a picture uh, and uh, they didn't know what Gareth was preaching uh, today. Um, and I just felt it was really, really relevant. She said, I saw a seed resting under the soil, soaking in the nutrients and water under the ground. And from above, it seems that nothing is happening and there is no change. But in the soil that, um, sorry, but in the soil that the seed is starting to open to push down roots and send a shoot towards the surface. However, to the observer above ground, it still feels as the days are passing with no change. Finally, the shoots start to poke through to the surface and continue to grow, unstoppable, rapid, luscious, new life springing up all through the soil as far as the eye can see. And she said, I think it's for those people who are starting to feel stuck or like there's nothing happening with this lockdown or maybe in their life, mm -hmm. that they're just waiting and seeing no change. But God is saying to trust in what we can't see right now. He's working behind the scenes and we'll see the amazing life, new life coming through. Thank you, Lord. And I just found that so encouraging and I hope you do. Your hard work is not wasted as you stand firm like Gareth was sharing, letting nothing move you and giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. It's not going to be wasted. Mm. And I uh, had a picture also of um, someone being like glued to the floor. They felt they were glued to the floor, like they were in shock. Um, and they could see everyone else around who were um, doing incredible things. And they just were like, but Lord, who am I? What have I got to give? And I just felt the Lord want to say he has... Um, made you uniquely everyone's journey is different and he has given you gifts mm. ask him and he will show you what you can do uh, he has gifted you so beautifully and all of us in so many different ways so ask him so lord show us lord jesus right now what is it yes